I'm here chatting with Matt Huntley. He's the filmmaker behind a brilliant short film called Lobsters. Um, I know Matt will, will give us a synopsis, but I just want to read these um, <laughs> this cut, this line that's actually on Film Freeway, if you don't mind, Matt. Um, I guess you wrote this, and this is perhaps uh, what the story is all about. Mark, a lonely man in a caravan park, has found his soulmate, his neighbour Tanya. He drifts off into a fantasy about the future together. Everything would be perfect if it wasn't for Dave. Now, I've obviously seen the film a couple of times. Um, thanks very much for agreeing to chat to us, um, Matt. And, yeah, perhaps you could sort of elaborate on that uh, a bit more in, in the synopsis and we can go from there. Uh, of course, yeah. So, um, I mean, the idea for the film really came about uh, from the opening image without giving too much away. Uh, so it's set in a caravan park and it's um, down on the south coast and I sort of spent a lot of time down there as a kid mm. um, and, and really just love the sort of visuality of those places and they're, they're sort of always in a bubble, they're a bit run down but as a kid they were just fantastically colourful and quite exotic to me. Um, so yeah, so the idea sort of came from this opening shot of doing a sort of very luscious um, almost sort of 60s um, opener uh, with sort of um, lush sunlight and, and music to fit and something very romantic and nostalgic, uh, but setting it in this quite sort of uh, run-down, realistic world. So that then led on to the idea of doing a sort of fantasy love story um, sort of washed in romanticism, but about very kind of normal down-to-earth people and that just seemed quite a nice contrast and that there might be a, a bit of a germ of an idea there that could um work out to be quite funny and it is it's really amusing um because actually everyone in it the 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 actor the actors actresses are brilliant and they the kind of people that you kind of think i know their faces uh and obviously um we spoke about this the other day um so they're, they're kind of those people you sort of think i've seen them somewhere else particularly for me particularly julia who played tanya um uh, and they, they brilliantly, brilliantly cast. And uh, just before we, we move on to, if you could explain to me how um, how you managed to to cast these people, you're absolutely right. The look of the film is really uh, lush. It's got um, um, a level that's rarely seen. I mean, I see a lot of independent films, a lot of them really well made, uh, of course. But this does have a le a really nice look about it, a level of uh, cinematography that's really um, eye catching. And I think you explained to me the other day that the equipment you use was. Um, I don't know if you say called in phase or whatever, but there, there is a really nice look to this film. Um, yeah, we do. So just as a, a as a backstory, I sort of work mostly in commercials. So every now and then we get a chance to do a short, whether it's funded or put a bit of money up ourselves, which we did for Lobsters. Um, yeah, and then we just sort of try and call in those favours. And luckily within the commercials industry, everyone sort of gets that that's the way it works. Yeah. So. You know, you're, you give work to people throughout the year and then you get those crews to come and give you a weekend back for free. And similarly with, you know, the lighting and camera houses, um, they're always really good, um, it, more so for like the DPs than helping out the directors, but the DPs always have a really great relationship with those guys. So they were, they're nearly always generous in giving us like ridiculous um, kit packages uh, for like very little money. I mean, it's normally the cost of like the delivery and the petrol. Sure. So on this, we had, you know, I mean, I said the opening shot is like a 25 foot track. Mm. We had cranes in there. There's a lot of tracking stuff. We did a lot of steady cam stuff. Um, and then, like I say, to get that really lovely, especially for the exterior stuff, we yeah. had sort of huge dado rigs up with generators. Um, but like I said, it, it was to give it that, that look was, almost the part of the character is really sort of integral to the film that it looks that way. And we weren't sort of just shooting it on an iPhone. When you had the idea of the makers, it's quite interesting. When you had the idea of making the film, you wanted to put it together, but you also knew you wanted to have a particular look, a high quality look. Obviously all filmmakers want high quality, but uh, you knew potentially you could do that. Do you put the plans in place before you're promised the equipment or do you make sure you've got the equipment before you put the plan in place, if that kind of makes sense. 
Um, no, I mean, the idea is always to have it look like that. And in fact, when we went and did the first recce, because it was shot down near Margate yeah. um, in a place called Manston, which is great. So it's in the middle of nowhere. So it's really flat. You get fantastic light all, all the way around. Yeah. Um, well, I went down with DP and the producer and, and we, because we were, originally we were trying to do it for a couple of grand. And then when we sort of got down and saw what it was going to take, we knew it was going to cost a bit more. Um, and it was actually the DP, Matt Fox, who I worked with a lot. He was fantastic. Um, and he sort of said, look, you, you can do it cheaply or you can do it well. Mm. So, which is often the sort of decision you make. You thought, well, if we, we got access to that location, the caravan park, and they, they were great. Um, and we thought, well, we don't want to go to all this hassle and bring people down from London and get a really good cast and then sort of cock it up at the end by not going the whole hog. Um, so, yeah, we, we sort of knew we would get the equipment we wanted more or less. Like we knew we would get, I think we shot it with, uh, Alexa, we shot it with really beautiful vintage anamorphic lenses. Yeah, um, so we, we kind of got more than we wanted, but yeah, we, we knew we would get a, a decent package some, somehow. Um, cause this is really a three hand, was it Steve, Terry, and Julia who, who play the main characters? Again, is that, um, how, how did you manage to cast it? Were they kind of friends of, friends of friends or connections? Perhaps you explain how you managed to, to cast them. Yeah, so I'd, I'd actually met Steve very briefly um, a few years ago at, at someone's birthday in the pub and had a chat, but I, I'm pretty sure he didn't remember me. Um, originally, uh, the part of uh, the Steve play, so Mark, the sort of main protagonist, it was written for um, a friend of mine called Tom Neeson, uh, who it turns out is really good mates with Steve, and they, they go back years. They used to do stand-up together and sketches and stuff. So I sent the script to Tom, um, and weirdly he suggested Steve for that role. He said, oh, I could play um, Dave, the husband. Yeah. So I thought, that's great. And then he put me in touch with Steve. We got the script to him. He said he'd do it, um, you know, really graciously. You know, whatever you need, I'll be there. We'll, you know, we'll do it. Um, and then a couple of weeks before we were going to shoot, Tom had to drop out. Uh, for a paid job, <laughs> which is fair enough. Yeah. Um, so he then, he sort of said, oh, look, do you know Terry Minor? And, and weirdly, I'm a massive fan of Terry's. And he's done, I don't know if, don't know if people know him, but he was the lead in The Mimic, which was a really great Channel 4 show. Yeah. And he's a fantastic impressionist. He does a lot of stuff with Morgana and all those guys. Um, and Steve and Terry were really good mates. Actually, they're neighbours down in Brighton. Right. They've, they've worked together a lot. And, so they said, oh, look, we've actually, we've shown Terry the script already and he really wants to do it. So I had a chat with him on the phone. So that's how we got him. And then Juliet, again, um, there was another actress who was originally going to play that role. And she had to pull out, uh, again, for work commitments. And she just sent me a list of sort of quite well-known comedy actresses that were friends of hers. Um, and Juliet, I was a really big fan of. I think I tried to get her for something else a couple of years ago and it didn't work out. And I said, well, if you could get Juliet, that would be amazing. And, you know, I got a number and called her and she said she'd do it. So it was luckily a really simple to get those guys because it's often not. Yeah. We, we talked about it previously, we were going through agents and stuff. But yeah, yeah well, it all sort of just fell into place and they had sort of perfect chemistry, really. Just, just really luckily worked out. Uh, and for those, uh, Juliet Cowan, who we're talking about, and for those that don't know, um, I think I, we discussed, we talked about this briefly, briefly the other day, that she plays a kind of, a, like a ditzy PR, useless PR marketing woman in Cuckoo. That's, that's where, you know, I know, know her from. One of the best things she's done, she was in Phone Shop, and yeah. she's, I can't remember the name of her character, she's the really awful wife. <laughs> um, and she's amazing in that. I mean, I, that's, that was similar to this role that you wanted someone that um, sort of looked like a real woman, but could be kind of like, uh, you could see she had a bit of personality and you could see she'd be sort of a bit sexy. Yeah. Yeah. No, makes sense. Yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. And again, it's, it's difficult to, as, as, as in all these things, when you're trying to explain the look and feel of a film, and obviously I have to do this all the time and I just implore people to see Lobsters. It's, it's a really great film. Um, can we just go on this a bit of an off and go back to this caravan park because um, what people listen to this moment is I actually live really close to this caravan by pure coincidence. Um, but 
Um, even I'm always interested in these things and the nuances of it because although we talk about a short film, actually you kind of touch on it. There's no, you know, all films I know are, are very difficult to put together and take a long, long time. But it'd be interesting to know how, it, for instance, the caravan park because you could have chosen any number of them. But how did you come across this one, and how did you? Because I think they they were really sort of bent over backwards to help you, didn't they? Yeah, we, I, I, I mean, I would say as well for short films, you really do need a bit of luck and for people just to get on board and help you out. Um, and weirdly, it was, it was really difficult to find a caravan park. Right. Because um, most of them are owned by sort of one of the big chains, mm. whoever they are. Well, not necessarily buttons, but the, the big sort of holiday yeah. companies. Yeah. Um, so, you, so we started off going through their press offices um, and we knew we sort of needed to be close to London as possible, you know, without because we were going to have to take cast and crew down. So we wanted it to be, you know, at most a couple of hours drive. So that sort of puts us onto the south coast. And, and like I said, that's where it was sort of set in my mind. Um, so, yeah, we struggled for a long time. We struggled for about six months trying to find a caravan park, mm. and we got turned down by everyone. Um, or we had people saying that they wanted a ton of money, which we just didn't have. Uh, and eventually we found this place called Bradgate Park, who were part of a chain, but they're, they're family owned. I think yeah. they've got a few sites over the country. And we spoke to them and they were absolutely brilliant. Um, we went down to Bradgate and we met the sort of manager and the guy that runs the pub down there. Um, and they couldn't have been more helpful. They just, yeah, like you said, they just bent over backwards. Um, and then it was only when we sort of agreed to do it and we went to them to say that, you know, what do you want money-wise? We haven't really got a lot. We could maybe chuck you a couple of hundred quid. Um, and they said they didn't want any money. They just really liked the scripts and the idea and they wanted to help us out and it would be just a bit of fun for all the residents. So we were there for like a day and a half and we ended up actually doing all the catering in the pub there, which we also shot in. It's one of the main locations. Um, and I, we know the pub. And I know the pub, by the way. Yeah. I, right. I, know, I, I mean, it's, it's, a really, it's a really just lovely place because like I said it's the, in the like, as you know it's in the middle of just tons and tons of fields yeah. it's just this anomaly it's this one little caravan park um, but yeah we pulled the residents in to be extras in the pub scene they let us redress loads of the gardens for the exterior shots um, we closed roads and but yeah honestly I mean it couldn't have been better really and it's such a shock because I live and work in London a lot of the time and people are so clued up to film crews mm. that they'll often just calls the public will just cause you hassle because they want to get money out of the production or people try to overcharge you for everything so to sort of have a little holiday from that and have people that just genuinely wanted to be helpful and nice was fantastic no it's really good it's funny just very quickly you mentioned about like the ripoff and there's another filmmaker i know there's lots of filmmakers I know, but this one told us a story just only about a month or so ago actually and he was saying that he shot his film and he went to one of these Building stone. I don't know what you call it, but basically they have like hundreds of sets, and you can shoot on, and then obviously you have to hire a certain space. And he was telling me something like four grand a night, or four grand for twenty four hours. And he yeah. said, "There's no way I could, have, I could have afforded that." And he said, "And I got it for mates' rates." He said it was still like a grand. He said, "But even so, you know, it's a huge amount of money." And he said, "And we went over by two or three hours, and luckily they didn't charge us." So again, to give you an idea of scale, this is for people that you know uh, will be listening. It's it all. You know, I do feel for filmmakers. I know, I know it's very, very tough, and I know that you're reaching into your pocket to pay for these things. And it's it's amazing to me how films ever get made from on it, particularly the independent ones. Yeah, it's true. And like, like I said, it's, you just need that little bit of luck or just someone that's on your side. But that's also true for the crew. I mean, you can have, yeah. you know, we've done stuff in the past, and you just get crew that aren't really into it. And you know, like one bad crew member can really destroy a production like really quickly. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, luckily we've just always tried to work with friends of friends or people that you know will be on board when, you know, stuff goes wrong or you're going to run over or you can't get people fed on time. Um, yeah, just a bit, a bit of luck is all you need, really. <laughs> no, I know, I know. It's, it's the foundation of it. I can't, I can't imagine how tough it is. Well, I can. I speak to lots of filmmakers. I know it's just devilishly hard. So when if we can just turn to the writing. Um, how long did that? Well, actually, I should have asked where this sort of inspiration came from, and then how long did it take to hone it down 
into because I've I've said this loads of times actually I don't mind saying it um, I always think that writing comedy is the hardest thing I mean that's my personal opinion yeah. I just think writing's tough script writing is bloody tough and then comedy it, for me must be the mother of of difficult things so how did you where did this come from and how, how hard was it to to get this to the final draft um annoyingly it was it was really quick let's <laughs> <laughs> reach that up here. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, you're right. I mean, I write a lot and it's it's really difficult. I mean, I actually don't particularly enjoy it. It's sort of more of a necessity to get work done. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the idea came from, I, I just really love caravan parks and I'd always wanted to shoot something down there, but needed a, a sort of decent idea. So that idea of just sort of doing a love story and then without giving anything away, if you've not seen the film, there, there is sort of a, a twist halfway yeah, through. Yeah. Actually, and then an, another little twist at the end, which yeah. is quite nice. So that just sort of came quite quickly. Once I got the idea of like doing this opening shot where you see uh, Tanya, who's sort of laid out in her bikini, yeah. smoking a fag and reading a magazine in front of the caravan, that that would be the sort of male gaze. And it was like, well, you know, you just join the dots. Like, oh, it would be her neighbour... He's in love with her, and then we go into his fantasy then together. So that that idea was quite quick, and then it was just sort of writing it. And I, I wanted to do something with a voiceover. I love stuff that's narrated, and weirdly, for shooting stuff, you can shoot so much more because you don't have to worry about getting the vocal performance on camera. You oh, can just course, you're yeah. just go in and, and do it in post. Yeah. So we shot everything without sound, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So that saves you like a third of the time because you can do everything, you know, one or two takes rather than ten takes. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, weirdly, we tried to do it in 2016 and we actually ran out of summertime because we couldn't find the location. So I had another year to just sort of tweak it and rework um, the voiceover a bit. And then weirdly, when we actually when we recorded the, the voiceover with Steve Oram, the first one we did just didn't work quite as well. And it was just, it was a bit too um, sincere and actually had to get him to come back <laughs> for no money again. Uh, and we, we re-recorded it about a month later uh, up in Soho. Um, so I got another month to sort of see what bits did and didn't work. So we sort of did another quick rewrite on it. Well, then it all sort of came and worked. Yeah. Well, I thought what we originally did was cut it, and then I did a voiceover to it for timing um, with a really, really bad Brummy accent. Uh, so me and the editor sat down and sort of timed the VO out to the film, and mm. then we got Steve to come in and basically replicate the timing of that uh, when we recorded him in the booth. And like I said, it's only when, when we then cut it together and it just – it it just wasn't as funny for some reason. And I think it was because, and it was me sort of probably giving bad direction on the VO record. Uh, but it was just a bit too heartfelt. Um, whereas we wanted it to be, you know, the, the, the humor I think comes from having that accent, but saying you know, this sort of quite rough, brummy accent, but saying these things that you'd expect, um, to be heard on stage, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, 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 I know exactly what you mean. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we got him to come back and sort of brummy it up a bit, <laughs> which is always really offensive to say to an actor. I can't do a brummy accent, I'm terrible, <laughs> terrible accent, anyway. Yeah, um, well, you should have heard my one. <laughs> honestly, I'm sure mine would be worse. I was looking at your, you've got your bio again on Film Free One. it's quite, what's interesting about it, I know you've done a lot of work, um, is it commercials, content, short films, um, and, also, and assistant director and production manager, and, I know, obviously, it's very, very tough in the film industry. And I remember, there is a question in this, by the way. I remember I was talking to a, a, a quite well, well-known well um, DP, and he was telling me, he's actually been around since the 60s, and he was telling me that when he was working in the 60s, you could literally get work. He was walking to a studio, you know, to start working. It was that easy. But yeah. as time went on, the studios got smaller and, and money became, um, you know, not more stretched, but it became more important. And then there was all sorts of reasons it became more and more difficult. But anyway, was, to cut a long story short, he was saying... You know, now, you know, his inbox, he literally gets, I don't know, 500, e not 500, but or maybe it's 500 a week of people that are looking for it. And all these people have degrees and try and get into the film 
film industry. And of course, he's got a PO that's still with it. So I suppose the question is, you know, you've got a track record and you know how hard it is. I mean, what's what would you say to and as someone that wants to get into filmmaking, you know, in terms of trying to break through? What is is there a, a key to it or what what would your suggestion be? Um uh, well yeah, I mean it is really difficult, but it's always been difficult. Um the problem I had, I started out in sort of late 90s, I left art school and just thought, I, I really want to be a director. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anyone. And I just wrote um, letters to, I got a list of production companies in Soho and just wrote letters saying, can I come and work for you? And that sort of led me to getting work as a runner. Um, and then that got me on set as a runner. And then I sort of did loads of different stuff for about 10 years yeah. whilst trying to get stuff made. So the problem then was that sort of the internet hadn't really come in um, and people didn't really, I mean, I didn't even know there was a commercials industry. I just assumed that like feature film directors shot commercials. Yeah. Um, so it was really hard to get information and it was hard, you know, to find out where to go and how to do it. And that's why it was sort of so nepotistic because it was only people in the business mm. that knew about it. So their kids could then easily get into the business. The problem now is I think there is all that information. People know way more about that industry, whether it's film or commercials or music videos. But there's so many people doing it now. Um like the competition is insane. Yeah. But that said, I think it's still the same thing is if you really want to do it um, and you're prepared to sort of do the grunt work, because it's quite brutal, you know, going in and being a runner and you get kind of treated quite badly. Well, I think that's improved a bit. But if you're good and you're just willing to sort of do anything and put yourself out there, that's re it is a meritocracy. So, you know, if you're the best runner on set, you will work. Yeah. Because there's so many sort of lazy people that are just expecting to sort of turn up on set and be given the director's chair. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, you know, absolutely true. People people sort of think they'll come and, you know, be on set for a couple of months and then get, you know, be allowed to go and shoot music videos. So I think if you if you can just be good at the job and show people that you're reliable and that you want to learn and you've got an outgoing personality and you can get on with people, um, you'll get those, you know, you'll get repeat work. You'll get people asking for your number because they need reliable people. You know, every department, no one wants a bad app in their department because it makes them look bad. You know, so the first AD wants his runners to be amazing and to be respectful and helpful. If he's got someone that's like mouthing off the people, you know, it reflects badly on him. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, no, that, that really, <clears throat> I, I, I know it's really, really tough to thank you for that and, you know, explaining, you know, what you need to do because it's like everything, I suppose, you've got to just work bloody hard. Yeah, but then, I mean, the other side of it is, you know, if you, whatever you want to get into, if you want to, you know, be a DP or director, that's, that's almost like a separate job because you have to do that in your own time. But now it's so much easier. I mean, you, you can shoot really nice stuff on iPhones. Yeah. You can get, you know, you can shoot DSLR and shoot, you know, cinema quality stuff. So on that side of it, it's much easier because the technology, the access to it is, you know, so much better and it's cost nothing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, creatively, there's always that. The idea is that if it's a, if it's a good, if it's a good idea, it'll somehow get made. I don't know how true that is, but you know, if you're good and you work hard, then you should hopefully get on. Brilliant, Matt. Thank you very much for that. No, honestly, wonderfully explained. And um, as always happens, it's amazing. And I always say to people, "Oh, it lasts about 15, 20 minutes," and before you know it, over twenty four minutes have gone. And it's uh, right. no, no, it's brilliant. It really is. It's brilliant. I mean, because uh, I've always said, and I'll always say, I'm a mantra really that um, I love talking to filmmakers because. I could literally, I know we, we've not met, but I could talk to filmmakers all day because you're never, ever going to get, I mean, honestly, I've done, um, you know, over 700 interviews. I know this, obviously, you know, it's a new set of festivals, but historically, and I've never, with filmmakers, I've never, well, maybe one or two out of all that. So the hit rate is obviously super, super high because the fact is that filmmakers are creators and it makes my life very easy. So thank you 
very, very much for that. Pleasure. Well, really, really appreciate. And that's it. Thanks again, Matt. Um, pleasure to talk to you and um, the best of luck with your film. No worries. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.